Okay, so welcome to the AI machine learning workshop. I believe this is the first time we've had uh, such a workshop. Uh, so it is um, somewhat of a new area. And I wanted to give a little bit of preface uh, before we get into the agenda. So we will have uh, two presentations today in the area. But uh, thinking about AI, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and networking, I tried to come up with three kind of use cases or applications for this, um, specific to, to what this means to networking. So the first one, I, I think even came up in uh, the previous talk indirectly um, in this room. So how do we optimize AI machine learning applications that are connected to the network? So in other words, what can we do in the networking stack, uh, networking protocols, networking layer, uh, specific to the needs of AI and machine learning? And obviously we know that uh, AI machine learning is all about getting large data sets and running a uh, simple computation over those usually due to learning or inference. But we also have to move this data. And clearly that's where the networking um, part comes in. So for instance, we um, need to, to explore how to get data to GPUs, uh, which are processing large data sets in a form that they, they can uh, understand. Um, as opposed to just throwing everything to the CPU, which we kind of done in the past. So there is some, some work ongoing in this. I would expect it to continue uh, to push forward. The second one is how do we apply AI and machine learning to various aspects of, of how we run networks, how we parameterize protocol stacks, how do we optimize, optimize them using Kind of learning algorithms and, and this is pretty straightforward conceptually. Uh, clearly there's a lot of motivation to do this. For instance, if we can come up with a new algorithm that detects faults in a network way before humans do um, and can predict these faults based on the time of day or, or circumstances in the world, this is obviously a really good thing. And the, the Nominal goal is to have networks kind of self-adjust, self-automate uh, to conditions and, and to solve problems even before they, they actually occur. So it's clear we're going to see a lot of application here. Uh, telemetry gathering is definitely one of the needs for this. So once we have, uh, again, the large data set for what's happening in the network, then it's a matter of running the machine learning algorithms over that data set and, and hopefully spit out some answers on, on how to um, improve things. So clearly that's uh, an ongoing area of work and I believe that's mostly the subject of the two presentations we have today. Uh, the third one's a little more, I think research oriented at this point, but um, if you believe that uh, things like self-driving cars will become a norm, it's pretty clear that we have self-driving protocol implementation and network implementation, meaning that the, the algorithms themselves would be generated by machine learning, for instance. And like I said, there's been some interesting research on this. Uh, I believe the TX, TCPX machina from uh, MIT was doing this where they were generating congestion control algorithms based on a large uh, data set of TCP packets and run that through the uh, data set, run the data set through machine learning and it created some sort of um, congestion control, which is always interesting, of course, because uh, the one interesting aspect of machine learning is the, the output's only as good as the input. So presumably if you can somehow capture all of the possible combinations of, of TCP and congestion conditions and what, what have you, it could conceptually produce an algorithm that is, is far better than what humans could produce. Uh, clearly this is research and it'll be a while before they obsolete our job here. Um, I sort of happen eventually, but hopefully not for a few years. So uh, I just wanted to kind of frame that. And my hope is that 
we actually see more of, of AI and machine learning in conferences like this. Uh, I think the time has come and the real applications are, are manifesting themselves. Hello, my name is Patrycja Kochmańska. I work at Intel and together with Aleksandra Jereczek and Maciej Paczkowski, we prepared a talk regarding machine learning in a packet routing process using Quagga or Zebra software suite. We will start by introducing a bunch of information about link state routing protocols. Then we will tell about possible improvement areas. We will describe current link state routing protocols implementation and how it is possible to use machine learning in current OSPF or ISIS networks. We will show you the results of our experiments in simulated environments and describe potential practical applications and their limitations. Modern routing protocols are taking various approaches on how to select paths for packets in the most effective way. There are two main classes of routing protocols. The first one is distance vector routing protocols, in which routers have no information about the whole network topology, and the decisions about the best routes are based only on the data about costs gained from routers nearest neighbors. And there are also link state routing protocols, which assume that each network node creates and stores its own scheme of the whole network topology and then independently calculates the least cost path from itself to every other node. The topology scheme may be considered as a graph. The paths are calculated based on Dijkstra's algorithm. It finds the shortest path between two graph nodes by adding up the cost of links by itself. The most popular examples of link state routing protocols are OSPF and ISIS. Over recent years, computer networks have experienced a huge and dynamic change. Modern networks are getting bigger, more virtualized, and more dynamic. The virtualized environments are being widely used in data centers and lab providers. The virtualization aspect allows, us to, allows networks to have more and more nodes and therefore to have a huge amount of virtual machines that are being dynamically added or removed from the network. Initially, network recovery time, having reached few tens of seconds, was considered sufficiently fast. Therefore, OSPF's original design was not comprehensively optimized in this field. However, over almost 20 years, these requirements have changed. Nowadays, networks are using more and more powerful and computationally efficient devices, and currently, such long, inoperable network state would cause unacceptable traffic loss level. Having in mind the dynamic character of computer networks, they are still expected to be stable and 100% accurate. The problem occurs when networks experience a huge uh, amount of link failures. In this case, the adaptation time of such networks may take even a few seconds. The core of our idea is to reduce recovery time and therefore faster adjust to the new network topology. The main goal of OSPF is to determine the best paths between all network nodes. Link state advertisement packets are being sent each time a change occurs in the network, and based on these packets, link state database is being filled. Dijkstra algorithm that is used in current OSPF implementation operates on data stored in LSDB in order to calculate shortest path tree. The SPT represents the shortest paths to each destination in given routing area. In the picture, we can see how LSA packets are used to build up the SPT. Next packets are used to build the overall view of the network topology. Such LSDB is later used by OSPF in SPF algorithm in order to create routing information base. Changes in the topological database trigger partial or full routing table recalculations with SPF algorithm. Full recalculation, of course, takes longer time and is more expensive. Since each transit link that fails is connected to at least two routers, it results in at least two routers forced to run full SPF recalculation. This recalculation has a negative impact on the overall network uh, efficiency because it may result in packet losses. The final base that is used to choose output interface to direct a packet to its destination is called forwarding information base. In case of full routing table recalculations, SPF requires some time to generate new routing information base, so the forwarding information base is not updated at the same time LSA comes into the database, and this creates network outage. 
this picture shows examples of routing table that is calculated by OSPF and forwarding table that is finally used to forward packets. It is worth mentioning that the RIP is used in user space and PIP in kernel space of Linux operating system. In order to create routing information base, link state protocol undertakes few steps. Firstly, it creates link state database based on LSA packets. Then it performs SPF calculations in order to create shortest path tree. The tree is then used to determine the most efficient routes and create the routing table. This routing table is then passed to the kernel space and effectively used to forward packets to specific ports. The current OSPF implementation is 100% accurate, but have an area of improvement when it comes to the recovery time after multiple link failures. To optimize the problem of recovery time, SPF calculations are not only run in full mode, but there are also partial or incremental modes of SPF recalculations in which not all of the STT is recalculated. However, full SPF recalculations still occur and lead to an outdated forwarding information base and network outage. Here we can see on which stages of OSPF operations the network may be in inoperable state. And as we can see, this is a relatively long period of time. Thank you, Patricia. And now let's focus on how can we use machine learning in current link stand database protocols like OCPF or ISIS. Uh, we want to use machine learning to enhance the routing information base recalculation step in the picture on the right uh, here. You can notice that we added additional parallel uh, AI algorithm. So our solution is based on the running AI algorithm. It can be neural network that would compute the routes in parallel with primary dextra algorithm. An uh, algorithm can be implemented in a, as I said, in form of a neural network. It would be trained to output the next hop from the local router to reach other router in the network. Uh, as Patricia said before, the overall goal is to reduce the time needed to construct the functional forwarding information base, that is with high probability good enough to direct packet until the full SPF calculation is done. Uh, the additional parallel AI algorithm, uh, I mean this one, uh, creates a temporary uh, routing information base. Uh, and then we pass it to the system as a temporary firmware uh, forwarding uh, information base. A uh, temporary FIB with high probability allows reaching the destinations of the packets because of not fully predictable nature of AI algorithms, the decision may not be 100% accurate, but well-trained neural network can get close to this value. Uh, the AI algorithm will anticipate the SPF recalculation, providing probably the best next hop given that LSDB state. The calculation of this next hop corresponds from the packet forwarding perspective to the minimum spanning tree calculation, which is uh, computationally more in intensive. Um, here. Uh, here's another picture of our idea. As you can see, we want to add parallel routes recalculation only in case of full recalculation request, since this is the only place where AI algorithm is faster than original approach. Full recalculation request is performed every time when transit link fails. This results in two or more routers always forced to run expensive full SPF recalculation with a very negative uh, impact in the routing of overall network. Uh, why do we claim that AI solution is faster than our original approach? Uh, well, it's simple mathematics. Uh, let's say that n is the number of routers in the network. So the extra algorithm is n square complexity, while neural network is only n complexity. So let's say uh, for 50 nodes, a uh, neural network will be incomparably faster than old good Dijkstra. Uh, of course, as I mentioned before, 
we don't want to replace Dijkstra with neural network. All we want to achieve is to generate temporary routing table and pass it as soon as possible to system forwarding table. Uh, we realize that the forwarding table based on neural network is not 100% accurate, but it's better than nothing at this point. We have a choice to use totally outdated FIB forwarding table or use the new one generated by neural network and rely on it in case of Dijkstra calculation are not done yet. Uh, AI algorithm uh, will be trained separately for each node to output the next hop from the local router to reach each other router in the network. Thanks to that, we will have a forwarding table that is good enough until the full uh, SPF recalculation is done. Neural network is trained based on previously calculated SPF routes and may be retrained adaptively while network is operating. Uh, the data set of the AIL algorithm is trained with the uh, per router data set that can be easily obtained in a simulation for every of network. Okay, on this slide, we have a firmware information uh, base state chart with the SPF Dijkstra based process and AI based process. Please notice that uh, the chart is not in a scale. However, the AI process part will be always less than SPF algorithm part. When you look at the FIB state, you can notice three colors, three different colors. The orange one is the network outage state. Our goal is to reduce this orange part as much as possible. This is a stage when we need to rely on outdated old forwarding table, and this state is a chaos. The yellow part is the state we want to run our network using forwarding table produced by AI algorithm. As I said, this is not the final state, and it's not 100% reliable. Uh, in yellow part, we want to control the chaos caused by topology changes and where the old forwarding table is totally outdated. Temporary FIB uh, is used until the full uh, SPF recalculation has come to its end. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's worth remembering that the complexity of the generation of FIB table with our algorithm scales with N. Uh, when n is the number of routers. As for each router, we need to compute the next hop from the local router. And this is done with a constant cost. That is the cost of having AI algorithm to generate the output for each router to reach. And due to the SPF complexity, this part can much, much longer uh, than AI algorithm takes. The green part is the state when all SPF Dijkstra calculations are already done. And uh, final FIB is ready to use. At this moment, we stop using neural network based FIB and we start using the final deterministically generated routing and forwarding tables. Okay, on this slide, we have a time chart based on our initial calculation and test in fully simulated environments. As you can notice, we are able to reduce network time outage even three to four times uh, in case of 50 nodes networks. Uh, so apparently temporary FIB calculated by artificial intelligence significantly decreased the outage time. And even if routing decision based on it are not 100% accurate, they can decrease packet loss level when network state is not stable. We didn't put uh, exact time on a scale since for different simulation environments, this time uh, are, these times are different. However, the shape of this uh, chart and the nodes times correlation of this chart are constant. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about potential practical applications and the limitations. Uh, the main targets of our solution are 
big industrial sized data centers with many physical and virtual devices connected in the network. The proposed OSPF or ISIS recovery time optimization applies to big and dynamic networks where a full SPF recalculation often occur and packet loss tolerance is quite low. Uh, moreover, the AI part of offered solution may be supported by using hardware AI accelerator, accelerators that additionally would decrease the CPU usage of data center sent servers, which may have different efficiency. Uh, we may imagine uh, that solution can be implemented on a hardware working and a plug and play manner. And this will be accelerate data centers network performance without significant inference in the network devices. Uh, this project can be also adapted to be used in a smart network uh, interface cards called, called uh, SmartNICs. They can act as a Linux-based router while being a traditional hardware NIC. According to our observations, uh, even one AI-based router node in the network can decrease the average overall network self healing time. Of course, this is not the rule. It depends where the router is placed in the topology. So if the router is in some critical place with a plenty connection to other routers, it will help decrease, uh, decrease uh, average outage time. Uh, now a few words about uh, limitations. Unfortunately, our solution will not resolve congestion problems. This one, this is one of the biggest problem in loading link state uh, protocols. Unfortunately, uh, our idea will not help here. We believe this would require totally different approach. And we just wanted to focus right now on a self healing time. Uh, okay, for the end, I want to say a few words about next steps. We still have a lot of work to do here. For now, we have an initial implementation in Quagga, software routing suit. Uh, however, the solution can be implemented in FRR or any other software routing suit. And uh, next steps are tests in the real, unstable, unpredictable environment with the frequent topology changes. So there is really a lot of tests for us. Uh, we need to compare uh, results from real environment. Then we'll assess the real advantage of our solution. Uh, okay, we put some more interesting information in our paper, so I very encourage you to read it. And uh, I think that's all we had. That was our brief idea. Thank you very much for spending time with us and take care. Okay, uh, thank you. So we have a few questions on the chat. Um, I'll go ahead and, and read them then if the uh, person asking the question wants to wants to have follow up, they um, are welcome to unmute their microphone. And of course the uh, presenters can answer as needed. So the first one, perhaps we could use reinforcement learning and use SPF Dijkstra's algorithm for reward function to make this more adaptive. Uh, do you hear me? Sorry. Go ahead. Can you? Okay. Uh, okay. I, I think I'm mute. We can hear you. Okay. Great. <laughs> uh, sorry, I had some problems when I had phones. Uh, we could use a reinforcement. Well, uh, I would say that this is a uh, implementation detail for this moment. Uh, this is a brief idea. Uh, yes, we use, uh, we, we thought about this. Uh, also, there is uh, Patricia who was more involved in, uh, in the implementation part. She's, uh, she couldn't join, unfortunately, because of the internet uh, access on, in her area right now. Uh, we'll think about it, of course, uh, about reinforcements, but uh, for now we just want to focus on the next step, which is the uh, 
test in a real environment. So uh, this is what we want to do right now. Yeah, there was a, a kind of a part two to that. Uh, looks like we're using supervised learning here. What is the neural network model, neural net model? How many uh, layers in it? Well, as far as I remember is uh, five layers, but you know, this is a kind of that uh, we have to experiment. <laughs> so this is not the, this is not the final solution. This is not the final implementation. We still have to, uh, uh, find the, you know, the, the, which, which, what, 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 what is the best uh, way to, we, we, we don't have a uh, final solution. So the, as I said, the, now we have a five layers, but it can be five, or it can be six, it can be seven. So it's, uh, now, uh, now we stick to six, five, as far as I remember. <laughs> Okay, uh, and one more. So, what are the events and or the events and weights on the events in the model? Uh, events in the model. It's the same question, Tom. It's basically okay. what is the model, right? Yeah. Like, what, what is the <laughs> model that you're using, and are you biasing them in any way, right? So, yeah, it's a full connected, uh, full connected network with the five layers. But uh, as I said, this can be changed during the the next steps. So it's uh, I would not stick to this one. No, no. So, so I guess my question was, what did you use today, right? Like, how did you train the model? What was, what were the design criteria? Uh, to be honest, uh, I miss that Pastoricia is not here <laughs> because she was mostly involved in the implementation right now. So uh, I think we can take it offline, and uh, if, if you want, we can just uh, we can answer by a mail. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, so it looks like uh, Christian has multiple questions. So um, go ahead, Christian. Hi. Okay. I the little mic thing is moving, so I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, so this is pretty interesting to me. Um, I'll just let you know I'm the co-chair of the uh, LSR working group in ITF, so of ISIS and OSPF. Um, mm -hmm. I also probably been working on this stuff for about 20 years. And one of the things that we did, you know, look at when, for my decade at Cisco, we worked particularly on a project for fast convergence. So we were looking at, you know, um, how to converge the network and end to end. So in other words, all the routers along the path, right? <laughs> for any failure. And we were using, for, to give you real world uh, numbers, we were using a, a, a real world network, a customer of ours. And it was a thousand node network, a thousand node global network. And so we, when we did all of our optimizations that we could, we focused on this project for many months and optimized up and down the stack. Uh, the fastest we could get the convergence down to was about 120 milliseconds. Uh, oh. We didn't advertise that, but that's what we got. Um, okay. And uh, of that 120 milliseconds, uh, the full SPF calculation was seven milliseconds, right? So I, you know, it's, there are so many bigger problems. I, I, I'm not, not saying that your work isn't, isn't useful, right? Because knowing how to do things faster is, but you know, we, you're sort of optimizing. We have bigger, much bigger issues. The biggest one um, is propagation delay, right? Yeah. The amount of time that it takes to propagate the failure, the, 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 uh, the new link state uh, across the thousand node network. Now you talked about that. I think you were sort of you were getting at that when you said congestion problems. Um, mm -hmm. It's not even, I mean, it's not even that. It's just, you know, our protocols have built in uh, dampening and, and whatever. And we're, we're working on that actively to actually really speed that up. Um, but yeah, and you know, so, so right. So this is interesting, but maybe not too useful right away. What I, um, so that, that wasn't really a question. It was just kind of giving you some feedback. Um, uh, the question that, that I had was, and where I would think that this might be interesting uh, for a current day use, would be if you were doing something to guess, um, guess at failures. So instead of just trying to optimize the SPF algorithm, right, which is pretty optimal, even though it's, I mean, I don't know what 
how expensive each operation is in the machine learning, right? But it's super cheap in Dijkstra. So even though it's n squared, it's still really fast, right? Until n gets, you know, unreasonably large, right? Like maybe millions or something. I, I don't know. But um, but what I'm what I'm wondering is, can can we do something with machine learning where if I see a certain failure pattern, right? Like I see a link fail in one place, and you know, and because of that, it's going to shift traffic naturally to another link, right? Which might, because of the way the network is currently running, might cause another failure downstream, right? Which then has a cascading effect through the network. It seems to me that that's the type of pattern stuff that maybe machine learning could could uh, get at, right? So you could almost be um, predicting a better route because you know that if you took the first choice SPF came up with, you were going to cause a cascade failure. And so it just avoided it altogether and picked a different one, uh, maybe a suboptimal route. I, you know, I mean, that's crazy talk from, from the chair, right? Don't you miss that suboptimal yeah. route? Sounds like routing loops, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, that, that seems like, like where the real power of machine learning maybe could show up is, is in better path prediction. Yeah. I don't know. Have you thought about that? Yeah, but this is a very good feedback, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, so, you know, we, we try to uh, find a way how can we implement uh, artificial intelligence machine learning in a, in a, in a reading protocols at all. So uh, that was the, our first guess that maybe we'll be able to, you know, decrease this uh, time with uh, Dijkstra. So uh, as you said that uh, your, your idea or uh, this this could be this would uh, require changing our uh, uh, model I think that uh, we, we we were focused only on the you know decrease the the this part with the uh, with the Dijkstra algorithm so uh, and well and you know I mean uh, also Dijkstra is used can use a lot of places in graph theory right so yeah. there might actually be applications for this you know, maybe not in real world uh, networks because they're not that large, even at a thousand nodes, they're not that large, but yeah. you know, there might be other graph applications where the numbers get into the hundreds of thousands where it really could make a difference. I, I don't know. Yeah, so as I said, we we, we need to test first this on uh, and in a real environment, then we can uh, say that we uh, achieve something. <laughs> Here and uh, but the, that was a very good feedback, I would say. Okay, so next question, uh, please share the link to your paper. Uh, we will have those links on the net dev site. I guess if you want um, an advanced copy, Mate can, can post it on the chat if, at his discretion. Uh, sorry. Uh... I, I see the chat. So that that yeah, if if you if you want, um, you don't have to. But uh, there is one other question. To give you a hint, this problem looks close to autonomous autonomous self-driving cars. So if the car drive could drive from source to destination, then a packet could be used to drive from source to destination. So are we doing the same thing that self-driving cars are doing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, feedback. I don't know if this is the real question. Uh, so, so I wonder, I mean, maybe it's more if we're asking to find commonalities and analogies in between different processes that don't appear to be uh, the same thing offhand, right? So, um, you know, thinking about maybe not so much self-driving cars, but when we look at uh, Google Maps, for instance, okay. so probably use a similar algorithm to to go from point A to point B um, in an optimal fashion. So that's that's an easy algorithm to implement. But I think once you start looking at uh, parameterizations of that algorithms and complexities. Uh, that's where the AI and machine learning becomes interesting, right? So um, to get from point A to point B in the shortest distance is fixed. To get from point A to point D, B in the shortest time, 
uh, is very variable. And that could depend heavily on a lot of characteristics, time of day and what have you. So it seems like the, the AI and machine learning kicks in once the algorithms become uh, less deterministic and you have more inputs and there's some sort of um, randomness to those inputs that, that maybe make it a chaotic system. So do you think uh, that's, that's where all this is going, is, is going beyond just um, re-implementing the, the static algorithms, but actually coming out with, with improved algorithms that add in some of these uh, less tangible inputs? Well, I think so. So that, that this is a direction. <laughs> However, as I said, we all not solve the congestion problems with the, with the solution we, we just described. So uh, we just want to make faster network. But yes, this is also the, 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 the direction we want to go. Yeah, so every, everybody wants faster networks. <laughs> Uh, let's see, so Salil, uh, sure, for large scale networks, this could be key. So uh, interesting statement. So I, I guess the question there is in scaling, do we, do we believe that as we scale to larger and larger networks, uh, at some point, I think the prediction was we'd have over a trillion IoT devices, uh, clearly it's only gonna get bigger do we start yeah. to need uh, to go beyond the, the fixed algorithms into this sort of um, AI and machine learning algorithms? Yeah, I think this is uh, for uh, our solution is designed for a large scale networks. I mean, uh, we, we are aiming into the big, big data centers. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Marta. Hi, my name is Maciek. And my name is Piotr, and we would like to present our uh, idea and the results of the research, how you'd like to optimize um, network performance using uh, artificial intelligence methods. So uh, first of all, our um, problem statement and the goal. Is, so the problem statement is that we, we identified uh, that under certain conditions, a traffic coming to a system can be unevenly balanced, even with all the features in working uh, to spread the traffic between the CPUs. So we would like to find an um, efficient way to to spread the given um, IPv4 traffic evenly uh, amongst the CPUs in the system using uh, receive side scaling. So first of all, we'll go over briefly what's, uh, what's RSS, what are the problem, how it works, what are the problems with RSS, and I would like to show you how we would like to optimize uh, key, uh, key generation for uh, RSS using um, AI. First of all, uh, RSS stands for uh, Receive Site Scaling, and it's a technology used in modern uh, network cards that allows the received packets to be redirected to and balanced to, uh, between the queues and between the uh, CPUs in the system. So it enables efficient distribution of network packets uh, between the cores. And uh, it also reduces the delay uh, with, in the processing because the, the traffic is spread amongst the CPUs. Uh, it can also optimize the, the software processing the packets since the uh, all of the packets of a particular collect connection or a flow are redirected to the same CPU that will be processing the packets and usually the same CPU in, uh, will process the packets in the user space as well. So we can have the locality of the packet from a given uh, flow. Also, what's uh, worth to mention is that RSS, while uh, spreading and balancing the packets between the CPUs, it, uh, it also 
uh, does not break by itself uh, in order processing. Uh, so the way the packets are processed um, in the network card, uh, which is done in order uh, while the RSS uh, is spreading those packets among CPUs, it keeps the in order processing. So uh, we we don't have reordering uh, introduced by uh, RSS, and also RSS is um, not meant to uh, um, to direct the packet to a specific CPU that the user would like to by default. It just it, it's limited to just spread the packets and um, balance the load over the CPUs um, in the system. So the quick look how it works. Uh, so network card extracts some data from the from the packet some character, characteristic data from the packet that will that can uh, help to identify a flow uh, those are usually um, ip addresses uh, for ipv4 and some additional information depending on the protocol like source and destination port um, and those are uh, given to the hashing function which also takes a uh, initial uh, value as a hash key. And then as a result, we have a, uh, um, a hash value, which then the number of um, lower significant bits of the, of the hash is taken uh, and uh, lookup is being made in the indirection table to, to specify the queue and eventually the CPU that will, that will get the packet. So for um, TCP over um, IPv4, the input set itself uh, is, um, contains uh, both destination and source IP addresses and uh, destination and source uh, ports, which totals uh, with 12 bytes. Uh, of the input set for IPv4 uh, compared to IPv6, which is uh, for the same type of protocol, it's um, uh, 36 bytes uh, extracted from the incoming packet um, for RSS. So uh, Machi will go over in detail how the hashing function uh, works. Okay, so now that we've extracted the input set, we need to run it through some hashing function. The most popular one is stop leads hash. And as a first step, uh, we wanted to understand better how this hashing method works and uh, because that's crucial for key optimization. The the principle of stop leads hash is that for every one bit in the input set, the hash value is XORed with the masked uh, part of the key that corresponds to that bit. So for the sake of presentation, let's assume we are lazy and we've only extracted four bits uh, for the input set and we use the so-called standard key for the uh, hash function. As a first step, we need to uh, mask 30 to most significant bits of the key and check the bit in the input set. In this case, it's one, so we need to XOR the previous hashing result with the masked part of the key and save that value as a hashing result. And uh, as a second step, we need to shift the key left or the mask right and check the next input bit set. In this case, it's zero, so we don't do any action. And we just move the mask uh, to the next part of the key. And in this case, uh, the input set, we have value of one, which means we need to XOR the previous hashing result with the masked key. And uh, in the end, we get the hashing result. And as a last step, we need to, uh, we have moved the mask forward and, but the input set uh, value is zero, the bit is zero. 
which means we skip the XOR operation. And as a result, we get the hashing result, which then we need to run over the indirection table. Uh, the indirection table is, uh, in this case, is a simple four bit uh, indirection table. So we use the four least significant bits of the hash value to select the index in the indirection table. Since we, in this example, only assumed two queues and mapped the queues alternately, which is the default way of programming the table, we can see that our incoming packet will go to the queue number one. We can also see that many different hashes will actually go to the same queue. Uh, and yeah, this is actually the end of the RSS operation. And now the NIC will start processing the next packet. So the key takeaways from how the top leads hash works are, uh, first one is that we can immediately see that there is a connection between the parts of the input set and the parts of the key. This means that we can clearly distinct which part of the key will change the hash value for source IP address, those are bytes zero to eight. For destination IP address, those are bytes four to 12. And so on for source port and the destination port. And also we can clearly see that some parts of the key uh, are used for more than one part of the input set. For example, bytes four to eight are used for both source IP and the destination IP addresses. And the other problem of the top leads hash is that in fact, we are not using the whole key. We only are using a part of the key for our hash calculation. And the size of the key uh, depends on the length of the input set. For example, for IP over uh, TCP over IPv4, we use 16 bytes of the key. And for TCP over IPv6, we only use 40 bytes of the input key, which is usually around 54 or 56 bytes long. And since top leads hash is uh, based on the XOR operation, and the fact that more than one hash value is associated with the same queue, it's not easy to find and predict where will our packet land after the key change. And that makes predicting this very hard. Now go back to Piotr. Uh, yeah, so, um, so RSS has, uh, has some problems. So as, uh, uh, if the incoming traffic as uh, little entropy in the input set itself, uh, we can we can have poor balancing between uh, between the, the CPUs, for example, with a NAT, mm -hmm. where we can have a a node in the network that is receiving the packets, and it's behind the NAT. Then most of the most of the pack or all of the packets directed to the to this system are have the same. Um, destination IP, so the active input set that takes part in the in the hash calculation that will differentiate the hash value from different flows is, is even uh, less than the input set itself. And then the other example can be a web server which also receives traffic with the same destination IP and uh, destination uh, port. So uh, Again, we can have, uh, depending on the traffic pattern, we can have poor uh, uh, traffic balancing between the, the queues and the, the, and the CPUs. Um, and also, if we have um, a lot of zeros in the, like Machi mentioned it briefly, if we have a lot of zeros in the significant part of the key, by the nature of the of the XOR operation, uh, zero doesn't effectively do anything with XOR operations. So, the more zeros we have, the less uh, alternation we have in the in the uh, final hash value. And then, uh, due due to the nature of the indirection table, and um, since more than one 
uh, indirection index can uh, can end up with the same QID uh, for a uh, for different flows. Uh, the traffic can be bunched together, and many flows can be directed to the same queue. Um, um, we can we can actually try to fix this by modifying the indirection table, but anyway, it needs a, a intervention uh, from the user to, to fix that. Um, and then uh, what's even more, uh, more uh, complicated is that some traffic uh, can end up with, the, with different hash value, but since we only take a portion of the, of the uh, hash to point to the entry in the indirection table, then it means that we can end up with uh, more flows or more connections that will have the same uh, lower significant bits of the of the hash so those will end up in the same queue and we won't be able to um, simply modify the indirection table to split those flows from the from this particular um, queue because we will move all of them at once and probably for such a situation we would like to sp somehow split them to uh, to, to balance the traffic between uh, between the uh, different queues. Also, RSS itself can have some issues with uh, tunneled and encapsulated encapsulated traffic, depending on the hardware uh, capabilities. And uh, the, 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 the not all hardware can look at the innermost header to identify the uh, input set in the innermost header uh, by itself. Uh, so we can try to improve uh, RSS and we have a couple, we have a few options. We can, uh, we can modify, like I mentioned, we can modify the indirection table itself. So we can split and balance the traffic a little bit. This won't help if the traffic has the same um, lower section bits of the of the hash because like I said before uh, we won't be able to split those uh, flows to um, on a per flow basis because we'll move all of them and then we will break another processing for modified indirection uh, for modified indirection table values and uh, the other option is to modify the key itself uh, this will have to like I said this will have to split the traffic which has the same uh, hash value itself but the problem is that this will uh, also result in a an all flow reassociation to different uh, cpus probably uh, because we will change the hash values for probably all of the uh, flows and also we can we can we will break the in order processing of incoming packets um, and we can also modify the input set itself, but it's usually uh, well. It depends on the if the hardware is capable of doing that, and it's not easy to identify uh, the input set correctly to to do the uh, fair balancing. So now Marta will go over the ways that we would like to use to optimize the uh, the key modification for RSS. Um, so as Piotr and Mathieu mentioned before, packet flows may not be spread equally between CPU cores by the RSS under certain conditions. But at the same time, a different key used by tablet's hash function can potentially fix this problem and it can be easily modified using one of the standard driver functionalities. It's necessary to keep in mind that each key change will mainly change the love to core affinity and as a result might degrade the performance because the application must um, be rescheduled to a different CPU core. Ethernet in general deals with this but with the performance penalty it's obvious that we should avoid it doing this, this too often. So we've started our journey um, to find the best key with changing the key to a different random keys. 
The same method is currently used by the Linux driver and the random key value is injected with every boot. It shouldn't be surprising that the results were also mostly random. So in the next step, we've analyzed the results returned by the genetic algorithm, which is commonly used to generate high quality solutions to optimization and search problems by relying on biologically inspired operators such as mutation, crossover and selection. And we've tried many combinations and options with surprisingly good results for pickup files containing limited number of handcrafted flows, which emulated NAT traffic and only differed in uh, source API addresses. Unfortunately, this solution proved not to be scalable and when we tried to use it in bigger, like uh, real life pickup dumps, we got stuck and we were not able to find a key in a very long, like a week long friends. And at this point, we decided to try to focus on uh, key bits, which are more significant than the others to narrow down the scope of calculations. And that's why we started working on Markov decision process implementation. And I really don't want to dive deep into technical details of this um, implementation. Um, but at some point, we just get an impression that we are going too deep and maybe it's time to try something less complicated like neural networks. And that may sound a bit scary, but the final solution, which we believe may help, is described as Bayesian optimization algorithm with the usage of unpolicy prediction and with approximation. So I really don't think we have enough time to go into artificial intelligence details. And um, we would love to discuss it. So if anyone has any comments or questions, you can simply reach us using, for example, my email address. But just for now, I will try to describe the idea behind this fancy name in a friendly way. So, uh, proposed solution at this stage uses pre-collected pickup file and RSS software emulator to evaluate collected data. And then this data will be used to train a neural network based model of an objective function. And using this, um, we'll be able to determine the best possible RSS hash key. At this stage, neural network will be trained manually by engineers. And it's important that one of the assumption is that the solution works offline in user space and it's not interrupting platform standard operating mode until a satisfying key was found or established time passed or process was interrupted. And then later, a user may choose to inject new key to his system, uh, improving traffic balance, or, or just wait with it. But uh, in a destined solution, everything will be automated and will happen in cycles. So, in each cycle, uh, we will like to evaluate each not previously evaluated uh, hash key using RSS software emulator. Then we would like to check if any of those keys is good enough. If yes, then we are done. If no, um, we would like to use all the data to train neural network based model of an objective function using the idea of automated neural networks. And it's used to search for the best architecture for given purpose in the data. And then we can use this model to um, find next keys, which should be checked in our next cycle. It's also important to mention that um, to reduce the computation time, model which uh, will be used for initial, for each initial program will be pre-tained during uh, research process. And this is a very popular approach. So, um, so I'd like to answer for a question, why artificial intelligence? And to answer for this question, we have to realize that this is a standard optimization problem of balancing the load among the server's CPU cars. And it's described as follows on a slide, where N stands for number of cores, 
and LI stands for current load and LA uh, represents the average for load. And now when we know that this is standard optimization problem, we can just connect the dots case. Complex optimization problems that cannot be tracked, but um, that cannot be solved. The traditional mathematical programming are commonly solved with artificial intelligence based solution approaches. And these approaches provide optimal solutions, avoiding consuming um, many computed, computational resources. But on the other hand, uh, they often find local minimums or maximums, but in many cases, it's still significant improvement. So currently, we are working on a model on this artificial intelligence site, so we don't have any hard data to show yet. But uh, I hope that soon we'll get back with some the results, maybe in a form of a paper or another presentation. Um, but when we're done with the model, in the next steps, we would like to uh, think about more key generated um, generators, like maybe it will be worth to add some randomness and maybe to reuse already prepared genetic algorithm. Then we will work on automation measurements and support for IPv6 because currently we are dealing only with IPv4. And this is everything from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. We, we realize that this is a um, work in progress, but this is our uh, lead in and uh, basically we would like to stimulate a discussion. So if you have any feedback, comments, Please reach out and all feedback will be appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Turn on my video. So let's see uh, what the questions look like. Uh, not a whole lot. Um, so I made a couple of points. Uh, it's interesting that packet reordering seems to be coming up uh, time and time again. I think uh, there must be an obvious reason for this is trending on people's minds, but clearly uh, if we change the RSS key or RSS mappings continuously, yes, that would generate a lot of, of packet reordering. But I'm assuming in this case, we uh, would only do it intermittently and hopefully there's some, some hold down periods. But I, I don't think it's reasonable to, to say we can never change the key because we want to avoid out of order packets completely. And I know that um, in some circumstances, what we've seen in the past was uh, a customer would basically run a test and if they saw even one out of order packet, it would be flagged in the test as, as a problem, uh, even if it wasn't, even if it, if it was an improvement in overall latency. Uh, they test for this. So there's some assumptions, I think incorrect assumptions in the industry that IP is supposed to be somehow in order. Uh, and, and there's reasons, there's valid reasons why it isn't, not just because of the network. So uh, there was a question. Have you compared this approach with RSS++ paper presented in 2019? Yes, we have uh, actually analyzed RSS++ as well, uh, but this approach is not solving all the problems because in some of the um, examples that we mentioned in the talk, like the push pop gateways for NAT networks and stuff like this, uh, are not really, uh, the change of the buckets that RSS++ uh, suggests is not enough there because if you have the wrong key, you basically don't have, don't use the entropy correctly. And as a result, you, uh, no matter how you change the buckets, you will not get a better balance of the traffic. So uh, could, could you or someone else give a short description of what RSS++ is? Yeah, RSS++ uh, generally uh, tries to modify the redirection table and uh, try to 
check which flows in the redirection tables gets most of the hits and if there are some flows that can be rebalanced. Uh, the RSS++ changes the affinity of the bucket to the core, to the, the queue or core. And basically it solves it that, this way. I see. Uh, yet another spin on um, package steering. Yep. Uh, so there was a question, uh, is a patent involved yet with this approach? Um, not sure that's a technical question. Maybe <laughs> if, um, maybe you can you describe a little bit about what, what the plan is or, or how you intend to move forward and, and what the reality is of this? Uh, move forward with this uh, idea? Yes. Yeah, we generally plan to train the uh, network and we are looking for some real life traffic that we can use for that. So if anyone can share some pickup files, it would be awesome. Uh, because we were mostly training on some, uh, trying to, to run our algorithm on some uh, completely artificial uh, pickup files that we generated to actually simulate the issues that we have seen in the real, like that users reported in the real life scenarios. So when this is running the inference, I assume it's, it's adaptive, but it's still based on the original learning or does it do continuous learning? We plan to do the continuous learning. It's not the ones of, we rather, the, the plan is to actually, when you see the imbalance, you can run the script and it will recapture the packets and relearn and re, and change the key accordingly. Okay, so, so my impression, and, and like I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is a great case of a, a parameterization that we know it's really hard in practice to to find the right answer and there may not be any one right answer so we've seen um, even simpler case simple cases like how many how many cues should we use on a system uh, depending on on the number of cues if you use too many uh, that creates problems if you use too few that creates a problems but we always have to take into account what the system is used for, what the load is used for. And I imagine this sort of, of concept where we have to parameterize based on, on real loading and real um, world heuristics probably scales to, to different areas. So I suspect that um, as, this op as this sort of uh, mentality goes forward, uh, we would continuously expand the, um, hopefully the data set, but it seems like at some point you need to take into account more than just the PCAP file. We'd also have to consider somehow to measure user, user experience and, and um, latency and uh, usability. So that's just a comment. Um, I think this is, uh, I think we're on the on the precipice of a, a large um, work in this area, hopefully. Okay, do we have any other okay, questions? Uh, uh, Joel, go ahead. Hey, how's it going? So re regarding the approaches, actually, I think it's uh, pretty good. And uh, we haven't done a similar, like, like we haven't used machine learning uh, for this approach, but we have been doing like some testing with the hash keys as well, because some of the things that, some of the challenges that I'm facing from time to time are around uh, the network security monitoring tools like IDS, IPS, um, and things like this. And um, it's very really important to kind of keep the flows stitched properly and together and parallel that flow as much as possible so you can actually uh, do as much work as you can on a single center node um, rather than scaling uh, to multiple server architectures, uh, sorry, multiple servers. And so one thing I was curious about is like, um, you did mention that you're handcrafting your packets or you're using uh, generated packets. Um, I, have, like, uh, um, I personally have been using, um, I'll just call it out like, you know, breaking point as a solution. 
um, to generate, um, you know, data center traffic and try to figure out like, you know, whether or not um, the balancing on RSS is working properly. And, you know, if so, like, you know, um, I actually check the RSS queues to see if they're properly balanced or not. And sometimes it's not the case because it's all based off of like the hash flow. And so if you're getting more data from like, you know, one uh, particular um, uh, client versus another uh, client, they actually may be scaled to like different uh, queues. Um, how are you actually like determining whether or not the balancing is working appropriately and things like that? All right, sir. I, hi, uh, I'm Martin. I think I can answer for this question. So basically we are just, um, for now, the, the only metric is we are just checking for uh, like the approximate number of packets hitting one of the queues and counting the, um, Yeah, we basically wrote an RSS emulator that run over the pickup file and then we try to find the average number of packets, like average than the number over the queues that we assigned. Which means we just checked the, uh, you know, how well, what was the average square, um, root mean square error between the queues. Oh, got it, got it. I think, try to minimize. Well, that, make, that makes sense. Um, be, because the, the number of flows generated by the client server pairs is going to greatly like, you know, impact what that indirection table kind of looks like, right? What do you mean by the, how indirection table looks like? Because you're going to be hashing off, uh, I'm assuming you're hashing off of the four tuples, IP, yeah. um, source, destination, uh, port. All those things. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you have uh, more, oh, I see. So if you're having like more packets uh, come from a specific, um, uh, from a particular client, I'm wondering if it'll stay balanced or if it'll actually shift over to like more towards like one queue than another. Um, how are you like kind of breaking that down? Like you, like you mentioned web server traffic as an example. Well, if you have one big connection and one the clients uh, running a lot of traffic, then you don't really have any entropy in this flow. So you can't really rebalance that. It's more for when you run the web server and you, for example, your system generated on the boot, the key that is not doing a good use of the entropy in the source IP addresses, for example. I then you can rerun this. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. We appreciate it. Great work. Yep. Thank you.